Welcome back to Culture Your Creative. Extremely pleased for the guest that I have today. Culture Your Creative is a platform that brings together people that um, are doing incredible things. So hopefully everyone that's watching or listening can really take away some new guidance or some inspiration to implement in their life. I'm the host, Luke Gledhill. I run a brand development agency called Just Up The Road that helps People, brands and companies really portray their brand message, their brand story and narrative to the end customer or citizen. And so today, I'm extremely pleased to be talking with the incredible uh, Florencia. Please um, explain briefly who you are, give us your name, and, and then we can really get a dive into what you do. Thank you, Luke. Uh, my name is Florencia Bolini. I'm, uh, I'm Argentinian. I'm an Argentinian entrepreneur. And um, what else you want to know? Tell me, ask me anything. Incredible. So we met a week ago for the very first time and instantly, I think it, it was about two hours, two and a half hours later of just a conversation free flowing about everything that you do what it means in in my life and what it means for other people's life so give me a bit of the backstory before what you're currently doing which is the nana hills yes platform but before that give me a bit of backstory um okay so uh, i was born in buenos aires um in argentina my mother is a freudian psychologist so i uh, grew up very stimulated but with no faith I, I went straight into politics um at the age of 25 i kind of needed to decide if i wanted to run for member of parliament and i was like this is not going to be my life i packed my bags and i moved to berlin i just in school of psychology, I, uh, I went into Jungian approach, more than mysticism, and within that context is that my therapy recommended me about 15 years ago, I didn't try ayahuasca. That is um, an Amazonian brew, a psychedelic medicine, very popular these days. Um, and so I eventually did and forever changed the course of my life. Um, so wait, let's go back a little bit. That was quite, I know you've got a lot more um, of history and details, but to get to that point where somebody had recommended you try plant medicine for the first time, which was ayahuasca, right? Yeah. Tell me a bit about Buenos Aires and, and growing up there before you got to the chance of, of the decision of whether to be in politics or not. Right. Um, so... You know, to be born in the end of the world uh, in a developing country is a very different experience than then, you know, living in developing in, in, you know, first world countries like, you know, London or, you know, big cities. Um, it's kind of, it was the only thing that I knew then, but I was very much in my head. You know, we are like very neurotic back there. I think that that is kind of a condition that we have for a while. But until that point, I never really experienced myself out of my mind. Um, the, the, the environment that I grew up was also not really religious, even though I always tried to dig and find more meaning in life. And so all that I could do, you know, I went to university, some of the best in my country. I had the opportunity to work in what I was passionate about, you know, in politics, whatever you work applies to everyone, not just to the people that are buying your brand. So I was always very curious, you know, and interested about scale and affecting people in a positive way. Uh, but definitely those ways weren't really just getting to my heart. And so kind of trying to dig deeper meaning that was kind of where you know um doing therapy is kind of a normal thing back home just to work on yourself as in personal development you mean in, in buenos aires yes it's okay. very normal we have like the highest the highest number of uh, psychologists um, per, per psychoanalysis per capita in the world. Wow. So personal development and therapy is not something that you have a problem. Like I see there is a lot of stigma in different cultures, right? It's actually something that you do like to self-actualize. It's something important to be on top of, you know, if you want to be, um, yeah, just improving your life. This is kind of uh, a medicinal aspect, you know, a good practice for one to have. And, and and so then there are different schools and depending on the school of psychology, you know, if it's like the gestalt or, you know, like Jung following the mysticism, Freudian way more like in the mind and psychoanalysis is the one that discover the subconscious, but still always kind of working within the realm of the mind. And so this possibility of changing school and suddenly working with substance that 
you know, it's, it was kind of like a, a night of therapy, you know, I, like a lifetime of therapy in one night suddenly are like completely kind of quantum leaps or big breakthroughs that you don't get even in decades of doing this kind of work. So so. I, w- I want to stay a little bit on Buenos Aires because I find this really interesting. And when you explained to me when we met the other week, so tell me again what your mother um, educated in. Which type of therapy was that? Was, was that Freud. Freud, okay. So Freud... Um, Basically, he used very different drugs to Jung, in essence, you know, Freud was more taking cocaine and very much over uh, stimulated in the head for him was more all about death and death. And for and actually Jung and Freud used to work together and kind of they dissociated and they took parts when Jung was like, no, there is so much more than meet the eye. And he then exploded you know, with other substances that were more like consciousness expanders. And, you know, he did like the preface of the I Ching book. You know, he went really deep down um, the rabbit hole of ancestral cultures and different tools to access a basically expanded state of consciousness, if that makes sense. So did you growing up have an option to choose one or the other or you were only taught Freud? Right. I was only touch that because of my mother's okay. profession. If and that makes sense. So as you were, as that's what you were saying before you moved to Berlin, you found that there were other, op- other educational. Yeah. I mean, I always knew there were other schools of psychology, okay. but at least it wasn't the one that I was exploring. And after so long of working with the same, it's like, I don't know, he was Einstein or who said this quote that you cannot really solve a problem at the same level that the problem has been created, right? So therefore, to try and solve with your mind the mental issues you have, it's just really never going to work. And so therefore, from an early age, kind of since I was 10, to be on therapy, going to cognitive development school, like being so stimulated since an early age, always looking into my responsibility and been questioning my role in the world uh, definitely became a competitive advantage when growing up. You know, the level of introspection that you have, how you are being touched to think in certain way, to look at yourself and then adding or topping other substances or tools, you know, to actually kind of exponentiate that work definitely became a very powerful combo. So you said that, what just repeat what Einstein said again? And again, I don't, I, I, I cannot say, you know, like I think quote, it's no, I think it's right, it, right? Yeah. So what he said is like you cannot solve a problem at the same level that the problem has been created. So if you created a problem at the level of the mind, you can't solve it at the same level, right? So. My wife and I have been um, researching a chap called John Keogh, a Canadian guy who talks about the mind and mind training a lot. And he talks about the laws and how everything is binding into the laws and, and very much so what Einstein had had researched and, and come upon. Right? right. And so what you mentioned something before that alongside what Einstein's quote is, you said something about not being able to work yourself out of a situation with your mind or something to that effect, yeah. right? Yeah, I feel that we're in, I'm not going to say a time, but we're, we're kind of conditioned to believe that we live in, in, in our own minds, right? And we can think of our way, you know, you, you must be thinking, thinking, and how can I think of a way out of this, right? Essentially, everything that I've understood from what you've you've learned and what you do now currently is that if you step away from that, you know, I, I've read that if you can't quieten the mind, you can step to one side as if you're kind of looking at yourself from the corner of the room and just observe what is coming through your mind. And that will give you some space or a little bit of clarity of where you can then. And quite often what I find is to go back to the, your point is that if I'm stuck in something, I'll catch myself trying to figure it out consistently. I'm brushing my teeth, trying to figure it out. I'm in the shower, trying to figure it out. I go for a run and I'm still trying to figure it out. But then after I've meditated, 
that kind of space lengthens a bit. And I often find in those spaces in between is when things really happen, right? Exactly. And and that is an experience that, you know, unless, depending how you grew up, how your family was, what you've been taught since, you know, the beginning, is who you believe to be. So until I had that experience of ayahuasca, that might, I never really experienced myself out of my mind or at least that I could remember that, that experience as such. So psychoactives in that sense provided a very reliable tool to dissociate, oh, wow, I'm not my head. And that's what ketamine provides today as a drug, you know, that is available legally in the US, in the UK for depression, for, you know, suicide ideation, precisely for that. It's like, oof. You know, like, and also, so I'm not my mind, help you process emotions. But in the case of ayahuasca, it's even deeper than that, because not only dissociates you from your mind, it also plug your soul into the power or your heart or whatever you want to call that kind of, you know, aspect of the self that is not necessarily our head. Right. And that is also not associated with a belief or a construct that we created in our head instead is is who we are it's undeniable when you have these kind of experiences it's completely relevant what we believe actually our beliefs tend to um fit around <laughs> that experience right um we we make sense out of what we experience you know that tend to fit what we've been taught to believe in a way and i think that that is um, the biggest revolution that this substance can produce, and that's why I think they are the guys of our time, because all religions, in a way, are kind of come through, and with all respect, right, but like come through our kiosk to connect with source, when in this way, it's like you have that direct experience, right? right? You do the talk. Yeah. And so, therefore, it's not a belief then you know. <laughs> well, this was something that I found really interesting that I'd never really thought of in this way when we spoke the other week, was when you started to talk about religion and how religion is set up in society now. Religion is set up as a way, as, as a belief and, and a faith, but a following, right? Right. Whereas what, essentially what you're saying is, yes, we can have religion, but we can also be ourselves without religion to figure out what you're trying to actually obtain from religion. Does that make sense? Yes. Or like the fact that, um, you know, like to find meaning in life, you know, or even the path to healing, let's say, let's not even talk about religion and let's get to something more real, which is we have a pandemic of mental health between depression, addiction, trauma, anxiety, you know, like just even the, 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 the fear of death, the end of life, or, you know, just like the idea of the lack of meaning in life is underlying all the mental issues we have right and so very proactive and pragmatically speaking of unless we can start figuring it out who am i why am i here who am i not what are other people's belief or indoctrination in who i should be or not and this sense of Courage, like what I've noticed that this medicine has given me, not only is this dissociating from I'm not my mind, you know, tapping into, you know, kind of like they, it's like a breath of air for the first time out of, you know, your head into your soul. And then, therefore, the courage of when you transcend so many things that you've been told to believe that are oppressing and that also are not true, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, and you have that direct experience of that, you live your life in a completely different way. You do wake up to a reality that there is way more than me die and that actually uh, you can become anything you want and even these experiences give you this insight the epiphanies to know why you are here for that is completely different for each one of us it's an individual path 
to healing, yeah. to heal ourselves, to find, you know, what are the rocks that we carry in our hearts, you know, that we've been carrying all along since we were childs, you know, yeah. when did our heart got broken for the first time, how we kept on collecting wounds in there, there is really no way to access or to treat trauma if you think about it. Uh, where does the heart is located in Western medicine, yeah. right? It yeah. just it, it just doesn't fit into the picture. Yeah. And, and I think that this has to do a lot with this is not a world that has been designed by women. Um, we women know how to access emotion, what to do in there. And therefore, you know, what what I attempt to do with my work today after transforming my life, and it's an ongoing process forever. No one has gotten there. When we got there, we, we're gone. We, we transcend to right. whatever comes next, right? But meantime, we are alive trying to align what we came here to do. And from that place, um, today I understand that it's like, let's try as you know our female power to introduce our vision of how we females see healing, how healing works for us and complement that with the male approach that is kind of dominating the world we live. And I think that if we succeed to do this and introduce psychoactive medicines for from the feminine approach, you know, to plug the heart into the power, then is when you can start accessing solutions for mental health. Otherwise, it's just prescribing drugs and there is no magic pill. Not even psychoactives are the tools, you know, to avoid us from doing the work you yeah. know it's um there is no j shortcuts yeah um, if that makes sense yeah no it does completely what you just said at the end then there is no shortcuts when my, my wife and i moved to the us we met this couple and one of the things that they said to us and it, it's always stuck in my mind is I said well it, you know here in the us we like to live the path of least resistance in life and yeah, I could never understand why he said that. And, and he was actually a doctor of infectious diseases. Wow. And ever since, you know, I come into contact and get to meet incredible people like yourself, it just defies everything that he said, right? We, society is, is seems in a way to be set up that is to be comfortable for people, is to live a comfortable life. But you're not going to grow or move forward or understand what you can do in this world by staying comfortable, right? Yeah. And I want to I want to go back a bit about plant medicine. Okay, you've mentioned ayahuasca and you've mentioned ketamine as two of the plant medicine uh, properties that you can use to help predominantly with mental health issues, right? Mm -hmm. This is the root of, of everything that, that you have built yourself up to. And, and one of the largest issues that people, I don't know whether people understand it or whether they just shy away from the fact that and actually know that there is an extreme issue with mental health. I mean, the stats say clearly it's, it's one in four or one in five people has a mental health condition or issue that, that they're dealing with, right? So... To go back to plant medicine and, and ayahuasca and, and ketamine and mushrooms as well, like when you and I had the conversation and my wife was there, I believe in all of that because I've heard other people talking about it. I've heard shamans talking about ayahuasca ceremonies. I've seen documentaries about it. I haven't done it myself, but I'm intrigued to understand and to know more. When I hear you talking about those plant medicine drugs, they they have a very heavy stigma attached to them, right? Yet, if you look at tribes or, or, or people living a life in a different country, in a different climate, it's a normal part of their life, right? Right. So why do you think in the Western world that there is such a large stigma attached to it? And actually, before you answer that, in the UK, ketamine as a drug used to be used in, in the club nightlife scene, Right. Still is. OK. Yeah. But in the wrong way. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And so when I hear you talk about ketamine and when I've mentioned it to other people, it's, it kind of feels weird talking about it because yeah. growing up, I'd only ever hear of people. Yeah. Oh, there was somebody taking that in a club, you know, yeah. and it's so to talk a bit about the disconnection between how plants really help us 
and, and, and you know, what you've discovered? So um, I think there are so many ways to answer this question, right? Um, and I would just take this path uh, and then we can explore it from different aspects and make some parallels if you want. Um, the first thing I would say is like um, old species have been taking natural endogens and endogens are naturally occurring compounds that you know, our consciousness expander that reveal the God within, that is what the Greek um, name of an entheogen actually means, right? And so these, uh, and under the entheogen fit the category of the mushrooms, the forms of DMT that is the active component of ayahuasca or fiber meal DMT that you can extract from a toad or the peyote or the cactus, you know, the San Pedro that is the mescaline. They are like hundreds of plants of gods, right? And they are like, in biology, and a chemist can explain this, uh, a food chemist, like the background of the Pope, without going too far, can really explain how there's a reason why these compounds exist in nature. It's not that God made a mistake, that there are hundreds of plants that have all these miraculous properties to cure all the things that Western medicine cannot treat at all, that actually just one experience can be disruptive to change someone's life on thousands and thousands of thousands of patients over and over again. So just by deduction right? There's something that doesn't make no sense. Like marijuana, let's put that example, right? From being so bad for you, now it's like so good for you. From being a drug to be medicinal, it's like 180 degrees. It's not like, well, now it's not so bad. No, no, now it's really good for you. It has over different, 50 different healing properties. It's a very extreme there, right? right. And so the same applies to all psychoactive compounds, right? And there is an agenda that is way beyond, and I'm not into, you know, conspiracy theories, but it's like, well, the most harmful drugs available to man are legal, <laughs> you know? Starting with alcohol, like the study of, you know, in the UK, then by Professor uh, David Nutt. Please explain that because we found that really interesting. Right, so David Nutt is one of the main lead, um, you know, pharmacologist in the world working on addiction. And the, he used to work for the British government and the British government basically requested this study to evaluate which were the most harmful drugs available to man, both for the individual and the environment. And alcohol rank over crack cocaine and heroin, right. uh, being mushrooms and LSD, the less harmful, right? And actually marijuana was was measure mixed with tobacco because that's how they consume it in the UK. Uh, that's why it was kind of in the middle. But in essence, the point is, it's not a um, fact of what is healing, what is legal. And definitely Western medicine doesn't have the objective to cure people because you can be medicated for something for 30 years and never get better. On the contrary, you start creating side effects that require other type of drugs. So using natural drugs is just basically not a business. It cannot be standardized and scale in the way that Western medicine like to make business happen. Um, I think that it's interesting that at this point in time, these substances are becoming legal because, well, or either we wake up or we extinct ourselves. No, it's kind of undeniable. Um, but also at the same time, uh, you know, yes, these substances on a biological level produce neuro plasticity, you know, produce like basically the, it, it loosen up the structures that we so rigid have grew up, you know, to like kind of like it are like wrinkles, right? The same it produces in the brain. So, and imagine that a psychoactive would be like an anti-wrinkle right. for the mind. So that allows to change, right? It makes easier to change habits and behavior and it's especially destructive behaviors. Naturally, when you start taking these natural compounds, you just naturally don't want to do the things that are bad for you. Um, and these are consciousness expanders. And so what a consciousness expander means is like, if we imagine consciousness like a rubber band. So when you take these experiences, it stretch the band like the hair band. And mm -hmm. then when you come back, 
it shrinks back, but it never shrinks back to the original size that it had, right? So then whatever you end up doing, and especially if they are like habits that are not good for you, you start like kind of seeing yourself like, why am I doing this? You right. know, like, and that is it, the aspect of having a different perspective of the same thing that you've been doing for so long. That's why it has multiple and break, break round, you know, breakthrough kind of um, treatment for addiction and all these conditions that there is no treatment from the medical perspective, including autoimmune diseases like cancers and so forth, right? Wow. So just to elaborate a bit more on autoimmune diseases then, I mean, everything you're saying, you already explained that in the Western world, there's no real place for psychedelic plant medicine to be monetized yet, right? Yeah. Well, now they are on that way under FDA. They, there is one company in particular that pat patent uh, the synthetic version of mushroom, right? So everything to go under FDA has to be synthetic. And so in that way, now this company just went public and just IPO uh, and yeah, became like a unicorn. And that's basically what they've done. So just to explain synthetic. So it can't be FDA regulated because if it's not synthetic, then you can't know exactly what's going to happen with each dose. Well, the thing is like, if it's if something is natural, you basically all the ingredients that it has, that substance that normally are a lot, has to have an individual path under FDA, like kind of ten years of research. So there is kind of just it is impossible. So the way in which you legalize this drug is reductionism first, which is you just from all, let's put an example with cannabis to make it easy, right? So you have the cannabidol, that is the plant. The cannabidol has a lot of molecules. Within those, you have the THC, that is the active component, that kind of the psychoactive, right? The one that makes you high. And then you have the CBD, that is the one in, in the body, right? That is kind of the body high without affecting the mind, right? Combine the work rate. And especially because we have these cannabidol receptors inside our body, our body creates homeostasis, the ability to balance itself naturally when you take this substance. So it works in so many ways and for so many conditions all at the same time. You don't need 50 different prescriptions. You just take one, right? In order to make it legal on the FDA, you have to reduce use all those molecules, separate them, and just create the synthetic version only of THC, made a pill out of that, and that is what you test for over 10 years kind of thing. That's right. more or less the process. Cost about $50 million per compound, and then is when a drug can be legalized so doctors can prescribe. Right. Otherwise, it goes the road of discriminalization. That is how it, cannabis is legal in the U.S. in 33rd, in 33 states is because the plant is being discriminalized. So you can use the natural version. Otherwise, you have to go synthetic. Right, right, right. So let's go back to Berlin because I, I still want to get to, to where you are now. You moved to Berlin. Explain a bit about what happened in Berlin. And then you went from where you went from there. Right. So, um, so Berlin was great because it was exactly the opposite of what I knew. You know, I couldn't even order my own food. It was amazing. And, and when I actually, you know, then from Berlin, I live in London and I just stay in Europe for a while. And, and, you know, I broke my engagement. I was engaged to this Englishman and it was again, all I ever wanted, kind of like the same at home. And again, I found myself kind of at the top of the mountain thinking then, and if this is not, I don't know what it is, but this is not how I thought my life would be, right? And so it was in that context that I went back home and I, I tried ayahuasca after breaking my engagement. And, um, and it radically, you know, changed everything. Uh, especially, as I said, you know, like my understanding of myself, of the world, of the universe, my role in there. And so I was like, ah, I didn't understand anything about life. So 
it put me in this kind of passionate um, search of ancestral way of healing before the Western world. Um, I moved to India. I dove into Ayurveda, that is kind of the medicinal um, culture, you know, it's like kind of the health of, of Hinduism, you know, where yoga, meditation, it all comes from there. Uh, so does Tantra, that is basically how to, you know, the practices that include all of that and especially our sexuality and how to, you know, use all these different tools for healing, like my breath, like the food, like the movement, right? Like definitely um, I completely like uh, if like if you remove one software and you put, you know, like changing from PC to Mac, right? right? A completely different world. And then um, I dove very much also, especially in Mexico, into shamanism. I trained into Africanism, all within the context of Western psychology. And, you know, as I was sitting and taking the medicine and traveling the world and digging as deep as I could to understand how it used to be before this world, um, the medicine started really to 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 show to me, to answer those questions of why am I here for? Why am I so much? Why I have so much luck? What I'm supposed to do with this? And and the amazing kind of started like it, it really it really like push you, you know, to like come on, step up, show your way, you know, show your feminine way of how you would like to be served. And at that time you know, I, I started doing a lot of medicine, really realizing I, I need to, to learn how to live life. And the experiences were very, uh, it were mainly held by men and men were serving in a kind of brutal way. This idea of the hero, heroic dose, who says what is a dose? Who right. says that, you know, seven or five grams of mushroom is a dose? Why we have to go to the micro or to the maximum, right? There is a whole load in the middle, and and that's also kind of more how we women see the world, right? And so, slowly, slowly, um, after procrastinating as much as I could and not thinking that I was in, I wasn't getting the message right. I'm like, this cannot be my path. It can't be that I have to do this work, but. Um, Definitely, you know, seeing the transformation that it was producing in my life from I used to smoke a pack of Marlboro Red since I was 12 years wow. old, right? So for over 20 years, I thought I was going to smoke all my life. I didn't drink always much, but like all these habits left me. Uh, my mom was like, you became a way better person. That's how she would perceive me, you know? Yeah. And so... Definitely all these changes sustainably that I was seeing on myself, I was seeing it of my people around, the one that I was just exploring and sharing the same. And that kind of gave me the confidence that this definitely work. And so after 20 ceremonies of getting the same message of, you know, really like pushing me, you know, the truth, you know, what else are you going to do with your life more than just take these medicines to the forefront of humanity? Um, I um, kind of, there was an unbeatable argument and it was when, uh, when the Pope, when Jorge Bergoglio, an Argentinian politician with a background in chemistry, uh, became the Pope. Ayahuasca in my journey was like, now, which excuse you have not to do your work? And I was like, oh, <laughs> whoa. And so since um, the Pope became the Pope in 2013, uh, I started to step up to serve 5 meo DMT. That is the most potent neurotransmitter on Earth. Um, they call it the God molecule. It's a cousin molecule of DMT that is the active component of ayahuasca. Uh, DMT being the spirit molecule, 5-MeO being the God molecule. Um, and I introduce what we call the progressive dosing technique or the handshake, uh, which is we introduce the compound with a small dose, you know, just like five milligrams, not 50 or 100. And then based on that initial dose where you remove the fears of not knowing, already comes you more, then from that dose, you double the dose 
and then you repeat the same procedure into the third dose. And so what we came to learn in this way is that people learn, let go way more effortlessly. You right. know, we are all afraid. The right. mind doesn't want to die even to go to heaven. So using, you know, like understanding with empathy how to hold space, how to hold somewhere in there, um, we discovered that this was a way more effective a way of getting to the end result rather than just start with a humongous dose because every mind holds like a cat. There are very, very few people that can actually, and normally they are like hardcore meditators or people that have a very developed or educated mind or trained mind to let go like that. It's not an it's not a kind of a standard given ability, right? And so... Sorry, Flo, yeah. let's just go back to from the ayahuasca ceremonies, you couldn't face, there was no argument anymore. You had to follow what you were feeling from, from the ceremonies to microdose, to start into microdose with, can you just say the name again? 5-M-E-O-D-M-T. 5-M-E-O-D-M-T. And so how did you, did you, how did you learn about that when you started to introduce microdosing to, to people? Um, I asked ayahuasca. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what's, what's after you? Yeah. You know, what comes next to you? Yeah. And she was like this one compound. Okay. Because in, in that journey, it's, you, it's a conversation inside your head that you are high, having with an intelligence that definitely is way more uh wise and you know it's way bigger than our own it's a completely different dialogue that what we know to yeah. be our inner self like an in inner talk we can say and so within that context i was like um what the let's say that i believe you know like what now i say i'm a shaman and she was like go to school right. go go and become a priestess of the most ancient divination system in the world and it's in that context that then I went and, and, and trained as an African priestess of IFA, uh, IFA divination system um, that is proclaimed by the UNESCO for a masterpiece of uh, humankind. Wow. And so I, I actually started following her guidance. Um, I tried to not listen to the message, but it was always repeating itself. And, and kind of I came to understand we don't escape our destiny. We may go boldly into it or kind of not. But so I much rather just go for it, especially because I didn't really feel that I had an option not to. Um, because life is going to unfold anyway. And especially if we are awake and then you just cannot pretend that you don't know if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So I just use her as my guide. I was like, OK, you are, you know, you are really pushing me to step up into something that looks completely scary. And I had to develop some courage. Um, it's not an easy role uh, to take, especially not back, you know, kind of 10 years ago. Right. Um, still, even today, because all that stigma, most of the time is also projected on you. Sure. Like if you are just, you know, um, but at the same time, learning that, um, you know, um, it's, it's been really, my mom always told me this kind of like, people don't want to be taken out of their pain, the place of pain. And it's very true. Uh, and so I've, um, I'm very passionate about it. It changed my life and I've, you know, the, dedicated my life to really bring these medicines to the forefront for the ones that are up to do the work Yeah. because transformation is the heart of the thing on earth yeah. to change your life, to awaken yourself, to change your habits, um, to be a better person, to be better than you were yesterday. Um, it well, takes a lot of work. Well, well, Flo, that goes back to something I said earlier. And, and as you were saying that and what, what your mother told you makes complete sense because people are addicted to their own pain, yeah. whether it's in their mind, whatever, you know, whatever they're, they're whether, wherever they are in their life. There becomes a point where if something hasn't changed and it stays the same, they become addicted to it. And then it, it's it's that it's that circular path. Right. 
it's kind of that feedback loop that doesn't change. And, and a lot of people need help with that. And that essentially really is, is where mental health comes into, into the issues with things yeah. as well. And, and tell me from the fight, from, from the five EO to you've done a lot of work with veterans with post-traumatic stress syndrome. And, and tell me a little bit about that. Well, so basically at the time, um, what we started working was across the board with some of the most complex cases that you could find from people taking 10 grams of cocaine a day, among other things, for people being brutally raped that were non functional, from, you know, uh, veterans with traumatic brain injuries besides the post traumatic stress disorder. Um, and what we saw is that in those cases that it were completely extreme cases across the board. There were breakthrough transformations uh, for all of these conditions. Um, and these were, if, if though, anecdotal cases, they were repeating itself over and over again. And so, yeah, maybe anecdotal, but, you know, it's like, 85, 90% of efficiency, and also that people don't qualify anymore for the condition. You basically are a cure. And so what we've, what we've seen is that a couple of things, and, and actually maybe this is a, a good time to introduce this parallel to psychoactives and the stigma, um, which is sexuality. And sexuality tend to have the same stigma than uh, psychoactive. It's also very misunderstood as a tool. It's also a big mess. And it's also where we come from. <laughs> so it also makes no sense. And what we've seen is that uh, psychoactives wake us up also to the reality of this energy that we have. Um, five MEO in progressive dosing, that is what we call, because more than a micro, it's like it's a small, but then you keep on increasing the dose. So eventually you get to a full dose, just not in one go. Yeah. And it would be kind of the same like being raped or have a tantric lover or a sexual healer as your first time, right? It's that kind of extreme. Right. And so is that... Um, differentiation, right, and that different approach, one of the things that we are aiming to introduce with my company today, with Nana, is like, well, how we female, you know, I'm female also from a biological aspect of a gender, like when we have the womb, we come with a special software, we, we are nurturers by nature, right? We know what to do with fear, we know how to hold you there, naturally we progressive dose, we don't, you know, overdose, we, we know we don't put our sexuality out of place, especially not in ceremonies, and what we've seen serving women is that also women have big sexual healing and releases through these experiences without being touched, wow. right? Yeah. And so there were kind of big breakthrough for me, serving the medicine for women, having the experiences and also all the release that it comes. And so when we start like looking also uh, the, the parallels between psychoactives and sexuality, orgasms also produce neuroplasticity in the brain in the same way that a psychoactive does, right? Right. And so when we start looking into the medicinal aspect of how can actually you can activate your own pharmacy, they speak of depression as a brain imbalance, but no one tells you that you can manipulate your own body chemistry and brain chemistry by playing with your sexual energy. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, serotonin, dopamine, there's like all these hormones that you can raise in blood to feel good, it, you know, working with your sexual energy in a way that is masterful, Yeah. right? And so that is interesting to see that all ancestral cultures knew this. Right. This is not new. And also all ancestral cultures also use psychoactive plants and medicines in rituals to heal themselves and also combine. Yeah. And so even today, um, shamanism is misogynist um, from my perspective, and I think it's quite undeniable. Now women are starting to step up. I spend the past almost 10 years of my life empowering women to do this work. What I touch myself 
anyone and any woman can learn yeah right and that is also at the core of um, nana thesis right and so it's like to empower women that are not necessarily a, a psychologist because it doesn't mean that you need to be a therapist in order to support someone in transforming their life um, if we have done the work on ourselves you can have the empathy to hold someone there from the heart, not from the mind, like my mother was trained, and rather be like, you are your shaman, you heal yourself. The, the path to healing is an individual road. We are here to hold your hand, meantime you transform. So I want to talk a bit more about Nana Heals. Mm -hmm. Because that is is the path that you're currently on, and, and which which I got brought to and introduced to, which I find extremely interesting, and 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 everything that you've done, in fact, is just incredible. But as you were talking before, I was thinking, and I've heard this said before: everything we do, generally, everything people do in life, is taken out of ceremony, food, drink, um loving relationships, sexual relationships, drugs, whatever it is, everything is taken out of ceremony when we really should be doing everything in ceremony. <laughs> right? I love that. <laughs> but even you sit down for dinner, I mean, most people don't. They're eating right. um, at their desk or yeah. they're eating food yeah. in their car as they're driving. You know, that's not really giving thought to where the food's come from, how it's been grown, why it's on your plate or, you know, that's out of ceremony. Right, but we lost the concept of ritual. Right. And that is, in essence, what we have to bring back to the table for everything we do in life. And that is kind of losing the sense of meaning, right? And that disconnection from ourselves, the earth, one another, spirit, our ancestors, things that even go beyond our three dimension. And so... Ancestrally, we used to have this sense of rituals in the moment, and that is what genuinely Africanism taught me while learning to be a curandera, to be able to hold space and give ceremony, right? How do you do this? It was like very interesting to understand how the ritual is basically you wake up and you just acknowledge your ancestors, your inner God, your higher self, that higher intelligence and forces that are at play <clears throat> than our head, right? It's just, if you think for it for a minute, and especially when you have these experiences, there is no doubt <laughs> there is more. And then it's like, okay, so then how do I start making meaning or like introducing this new understanding into my everyday life? How do I rebuild my daily life into a practice that more than a routine, which is I'm making these uh, every day because I want something out of it, like having a good body or having a good health, but rather, you know, an artistic expression of your everyday life, how, how life can be, your, you know, it's, it's our masterpiece. This is our creation. You know, we are creating our life with our thoughts, with what we say, with what we do, ideally have that into alignment. So how can we build our everyday life, even from washing our teeth and whatever we do that is routinary, like food, and just make it a glorious experience, right? Including like the way that we love one another, that we enjoy our bodies, either if it's in a sport, in lovemaking, in, you know, in just enjoying the food and definitely also the substance exacerbate, expand all the senses, right? Everything suddenly, it has a completely different form of experience. We expand our capacity to feel too, right? Um, well, I, I really want to get back into Nana Hills, but there was something on my mind as you were talking then. It's as if most people do things to get away from themselves, yeah. whether that's food through addiction, right? That, or that's what can lead to addiction, whether it's through food, alcohol, substance abuse, bad sexual relationships, gambling, whatever that is, people are doing things to try to get out of their head, to get away from themselves. But it's, We haven't been taught anything else really, right. right? Right. This is the part where we got disconnected from who we truly are. And that is kind of like what Nana is aiming to do is like, okay, 
we prepare you to the experience of waking you up, which actually just ketamine, that is the only strong psychoactive that is legal today in medical settings. So we work with what we have. It's a big compromise to work with a chemical drug compared to a natural one, right? But at least it can give you a very reliable experiences of I'm not my mind. And so what we are aiming at Anana is standardizing their preparation, you know, their personalization of this experience for you, what is a dose? It's like the minimum effective dose for you, right? And there are variables of how to assess a person, not only biologically, mentally, but also emotionally and spiritually before determining what is a dose. And then preparing the person, because if you've been raped or you have an addiction problem or whatever is like chronic pain, it's going to show up in the experience, something that gives you insight as why you are where you're at in your life. So it's very important, the preparation. Everyone talk about the integration. <laughs> yes, for sure. But also the preparation is very important. And then how can you administer to someone in this progressive dosing technique rather than a punch in the face, like into a full dose? especially also in a doctor's office full of computers and phones and people that don't have a clue the right. depths of the experience you're going through. They are in their phone, they open the door and you're like fully dissociating. It can be a very scary experience, right? So, so let's explain a little bit more about that then because what Nana Hill, the platform essentially does is everything that you're talking about, it has a collective of incredible women that will be there to help guide you through new life processes, new life stages, and leading into microdosing with ketamine. Progressive dosing. Pro sorry, progressive dosing. Yeah. Yes. But, I but sorry, Floor, just to say, to add on to that, because ketamine is legal, you can go to the doctors and they will prescribe you a high dose, but there is no guidance as to what you do with that, with that drug. But essentially what Nana, Nana Heels as a platform is doing is, is giving you that whole holistic wellness approach to everything to be able to progressive dose on something that can help right. you, right? Right. We created the first integrative protocol in the space. So basically you can be, you know, assessed personalize, prepare, administer, and integrate with this approach with any compound as they become legal, yeah. basically, right? And so um, also the concept of integration is just not to integrate the experience in itself, the psycho-spiritual element or aspect of the experience, right? Of oh, there is no God, then there is a God, then, oh, I am God. Right. It's kind of a lot of a process for someone to process. Depending the compound, it's not so radical, that understanding, but with 5-MeO, you are into that in less than a minute, right. right? And so it's so important to go slowly, not to traumatize people. It also, when you work... Ketamine kind of doesn't really show you much of your darkness. It's a very easy ride compared to plant medicines. But um, I'm curious to see how synthetic mushroom work because they do show you your shadow as well as your light. That's why it's important to work with slower doses. There is no need to go all the way from zero to 100 in the first time. And that's also where integration comes to be as not only making sense of that experience of psycho spiritual experience but also then how do i start changing my life with this new understanding of where am i at who am i what are the rocks that i've been carrying in my heart that i managed to take out how do i start healing these aspects of my life and so there are some um, fundamentals uh, truth that are undeniable and unnegotiable in order to cure from mental illness, right? And so it's just not, that's why the approach to psychology alone or medicine, you know, in the body without connecting, it just doesn't work. You know, they're like, there is no one condition that psychology is treating successfully. They are just epidemic of all the different type of uh, conditions. And, and so nutrition, 
sexuality, movement, meditation, breathing, you know, lifestyle practices that you have to weave into your life cannot be negotiated. It's not that you are going to do whatever you want, drink alcohol, take drugs, you know, uh, watch porn, come 10 times a day, like don't move and take one pill and you are going to be okay. Right. And whomever is telling you that is just telling you something that is a lie. Yeah. And, and I think that this is the moment where from our perspective is like we aim to teach you discernment to give you the roadmap so online you can have the step by step from the process of you assessing yourself in all these different ways as a complete human not just the mind or the body completely dissociative you know not connected and then also from that place what are the practices that you need to live how do you live a woke life and we are aiming to simplify that in an in our online platform and then the nanas are these women that have gone through that process themselves that come to be your cheerleader you know to mentor like come on you got these keep on doing you know the the homework in the in the platform with the app you know get your feedback loops it's important to have someone that is counting on you that is waiting for you to deliver you become so much more um efficient and effective and this is really difficult work yeah. right and so the more support that we can give with human empowerment with technology with simplifying the complexity of what that it takes to really live a work life that's really what we aim and it can be as affordable as you can pay it doesn't have to be super expensive. We don't need to work with doctors that cost so much per hour because doctors cannot even know how to prescribe cannabis. And now they are prescribing ketamine. Right. Right. Yeah. And so and they are not only prescribing, they are administrating ketamine without ever having had an experience in their life. Yeah of this sort. Yeah. Right. They just come and give you an injection and there you go. Right. And in my own experiences it was scary. I was like, how this is legal in right. this way, you know? FDA doesn't really regulate around the aspect that made these medicines to be effective um, and efficient and safe and, um, and not addictive. And so that's what we are aiming to do with Nana Hills. It's like to own all the experiential component of these medicines and to be able to provide a safe environment that is more like the last thing you want is like white lights, computers noise, you know, cold environment that you are alone. It's scary already, yeah. you know? And so kind of the nurturer, the feminine, the cozy, the loving, you know, the empathic um, is really what, um, what we are aiming for. And so just explain Nana, the word N-A-N-A, -N -A, Nana. Mm -hmm. Because you told me last time, what yes. does it? So um, on one hand, um, Nana is <clears throat> the way that I refer to my grandmother. And I think in, in all cultures, the Nana, the Nanny, you know, it's like a, a very common loving way of um, sharing, you know, about one's grandmother. Um, at the same time, in, in Ifa, the tradition where I train as a priestess, um, Nana is the highest initiation that a woman can have as a priestess. Wow. Uh, it's kind of the highest rank or honor that you can grow to be. Um, and, and this is really what we strive to provide, to bring this role back to society, that a woman, regardless of our profession, you can be a nana and have these trainings. So really to know how to hold someone in that place, how to be able to love and take care of people in this more sophisticated way without having to be romantic love, right. without giving to get, more like kind of a service and also it's kind of like a do love transformation, if you may. And also, um, the psychedelic experience is kind of these, um, you, you cross to the other side. You go to these places that you go when you're asleep, when you are born and when you die, but you're awake. Yeah. And this really changed the game, right? Um, well, it was just what you were saying before about the experience where when a doctor prescribes or administrates the ketamine it made me think well perhaps that's why there is a large stigma attached to 
psychoactive drugs because if you mention to people about um, progressive or microdosing on mushrooms, somebody's going to say, oh, I took mushrooms when I was a teenager and I had a really bad experience. Same with LSD or acid yeah. or whatever it is. Personally, I've never, but I've heard it from other people. But what you're what you're basically saying is because they took a large amount of it. Nobody really knew. They just took as much as they could to get out of their head. That's basically what more or less everyone does in the wrong environment, without preparation, without any knowledge. They just go and you know, and that's why you have the most horrendous experiences. Uh, and that's what happened when something is illegal. Then also you don't even know what you are taking. Who tells you that that is that? Uh, a dealer that is basically someone with no integrity doing things that are illegal, well, is he going to tell you, right? And so in a different way, um, that is kind of the, mis the misunderstanding we have today is that no one knows because unless you've been doing underground work or working like in the very particular jurisdictions where these drugs are not legislated or preserved, like in Brazil, in Mexico, in Spain, like in some particular, um, there is no way for you to know. So doctors don't really know, psychologists don't really know, researchers don't really know. They are just basically giving you and looking into the biological aspects of what they are doing. but. Neuroplasticity, yes, is the aftermath. This is all about the mystical experience that happened when you are on the experience. That's where all the healing lies. And so we've seen it over and over again, over thousands of cases for decades. Um, and we realize, wow, the complexity that it takes to really provide this experience at scale is completely oversimplified for the medical establishment or the medical approach, because to introduce the heart into the medical equation creates a level of complexity that there is no reference out there. And so that is what we are aiming to set a bar at, at Nana Hills and say, yo, moment, it's not as simple as you're making it. It, it doesn't work, Western medicine, it doesn't fit into Western medicine to introduce psychoactive. Well, let's put it into psychedelic therapy. It's still in the mind, right? And so unless you've, uh, you are a transpersonal psychologist with personal experience taking these medicines, I don't know how you can help someone integrate these experiences, right? right? Um, to the point of my mom, right? And so from that perspective, what we thought of like the harm reduction strategy at NANA is let's create the integrative protocol weaving all these practices together around the mystical experience, kind of like all these very robust entourage of practices that we provide. And let's create this protocol for all stakeholders. So doctors, psychologists, researchers, clinicians, biotech companies, and also individuals and patients can access and have the insight that we've got for decades. So basically they don't need to waste their time because we cannot waste, we don't have time to waste yeah. to learn all that we've learned over and over again, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes complete sense. I could uh, talk and listen to you for days. It's just incredible the journey that you've gone on to understand everything that you know. And I can feel the energy and passion that you give both when, when we met last time and even now, you have a way to articulate this that that makes my mind um, envision and be there what, what, what you've been through. And so tell me what, um, what the future looks like for Nana Hills and for progressive dosing. <laughs> nice. Well, I believe that, you know, the future doesn't really exist. We are making it today with every decision, you know, and every step we take. Um, what I pray for is that actually we can find uh, a way in the world. We are like the only female-led startup in the space um, with actually healers um, working on it, right? And um, it's been um, extremely hard, that uh, transition from medicine woman to business woman. Um, it has a completely different set of rules and objectives than the the world where I come from, right? That is to help people thrive. Um, 
the our aim uh, you know now providing our first because what we are doing really is scaling the solution that we've been testing and developing for over a decade bespoke right and so we know that these work by heart and so now how do we translate this solution at scale and in this way you can immortalize it and then translate it as many languages as possible to be the software layer. So anyone is stepping into the space that wants to open a clinic, that wants to become a practitioner, that wants to get into the space to help people transform and heal, that it is by far the most um, rewarding you know, profession that I've ever had, um, can have a way to get that done and feel supported and where do you go today and learn you're going to go and become a psychologist or like a researcher like no there are not professions out there that can actually train you for these and and so that's what we aim to become you know is to portray and to introduce a new field of medicine that include the heart into the equation that is the female vision of how healing works and that empower women to step up to do this work that we've just been doing from the beginning of time. You know, the world needs more nourishment, more loving, more like yumminess, you know, more nanas, you know, and and just to heal. We, we, we think that, you know, collaboration is also really important, especially in an industry that no one knows. And rather than go full speed, all in as cannabis unfold, it's a completely different of um, mess that is going to happen if psychoactive industries unfold in the same way that cannabis did. And also, um, when you messed up people in this way, it's very hard to get them back. Um, the opioid epidemics is going to be nothing compared of you know, how over prescriptions without preparation and integration, without really understanding um, the complexities of this substance um, can have. So, so, you know, there is a lot of praying. So we can really, um, you know, set the bar and hopefully collaborate with the main players in the space um, to really bring, you know, our complementary um, skills, uh, you know, to build businesses in itself, it's also a skill that is not necessarily complementary with knowing how to heal. And there is so many industries, so many, sorry, companies within this industry that have to be born in order for full healing to, to happen and to work, right? So, so that's kind of the main, the main, the main prayer these days, you know, to, to call in, you know, those entrepreneurs that really care to change life at scale and to have the chance, you know, to bring a product to market that, that can be legendary in that sense. Well, I have faith and I'm extremely excited for you and for the platform Nana Heals. I have uh, no doubt that it will go on and succeed in massive success and help millions and millions of people. Um, before we wrap this up, where can people find out more about you and about Nana Heals? NanaHeals.com. Uh, uh, and my, I'm in Instagram, that is Flor Bolini. Um, Bolini is like with B and double L. Um, and then um, Facebook as well, Florencia Bolini. And nanahills.com is basically the website. And in there, they would get uh, also in uh, Nana Hills in um, Instagram. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much for Thank your time. You so I really much. appreciate of it. Of course. I really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was amazing. You were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that... Uh...